Hey guys, it's Dylan. So just this morning, Ray for Tesla tweeted, LG will for the first time actually provide Tesla with NCMA, nickel, cobalt, manganese, aluminum, anode materials, according to a report. These will contain 90% nickel and the new anode will be used in cells for the Model Y starting in July. Such anode materials will also be provided to GM in September. But this really isn't news news. If we go back to this article, December 18th, 2020, we see that LG Energy Solutions is planning to roll out NCMA batteries starting in the second half of this year. The portion of nickel will be about 90% and cobalt will be about 5%, down from roughly 10% previously with a nickel cobalt aluminum version. And a simple answer for why the addition of aluminum, the problem is stability. Aluminum boosts output and lowers chemical instability. And the report did not specify if it was US Model Ys or just China, but Ray seems to think it's probably the Chinese made Model Ys. And generally speaking, the nickel cobalt manganese aluminum versions are supposed to have a little bit better energy density and as mentioned they will have a little bit less cobalt. Two quick tweets from Gary Black because he's probably the most bearish Tesla bull that there is but he says investors are underestimating the importance of this Model S delivery event on June 3rd. It's going to be the fastest production car. It'll have a halo effect for the entire Tesla fleet and this Fremont event can change the narrative back to EV fundamentals which are very strong. More on that in a moment. But he continues, according to sources, Tesla demand far exceeds supply, eight DSO or days sales outstanding, that would be my interpretation, at the end of quarter one. China, May and June volumes are likely to be over 30,000 units per month and second quarter Tesla volumes could exceed 210,000. Right now, the street consensus 205,000 with 10,000 Model S deliveries possible. After the second quarter, the street estimates of 866,000 could go to 900,000 if Berlin or Austin open in quarter four. Now, I personally think that if Shanghai and Fremont ramp well, then Tesla can actually hit that 900,000 delivery mark this year without any meaningful production from Austin or Berlin. And that DSO or the day's sales outstanding is really just a barometer of the health of your cash flow. So a lower DSO number basically means your cash flow is better. And for context, you can see that Ford's average DSO from 2010 to 2020 was 34. So Tesla's being at eight is basically a very bullish thing. But just to help drive this point home a little bit more, DSO represents the average number of days that it takes for credit sales to be converted into cash or how long it takes a company to collect its accounts receivables. Just remember, the lower the number, the better. And Pierre tweeted, Tesla is definitely in another league. While BMW and Daimler struggle to produce cars that don't differentiate and get less wanted, their returns are under pressure in teens. And so this chart, you can see that Tesla is red, Daimler is the baby blue, and BMW is the dark blue. And these trends are showing that Tesla's cash returns on operating assets are steadily increasing while its peers are steadily decreasing. And it says, this strongly supports our conviction that Tesla is manufacturing and selling cars in a way that fundamentally contrasts with the traditional auto industry. They use a simple product platform, integrated manufacturing, uncluttered interior, direct distribution, and high software value added do make a difference when one looks at returns. The difference in financial performance increases the challenge for incumbents to invest in the electric transition and compete with Tesla. And the cash return on assets is a really good indicator to know. As you can see, it's used to benchmark a business's performance with other businesses in the same industry. It's an efficiency ratio that rates the actual cash flows to a company's assets without being affected by income recognition. But to simplify even further, a high cash ROA typically indicates a company earns more net income from $1 of assets than the average company, which is a sign of efficiency. And if you get confused, just slow down and read the term, cash return on assets. It's basically what a company's assets are generating in terms of actual cash flow. The higher the number, the more their assets are generating cash, which of course is a good thing. And speaking of continuously improving, there was a tweet back May 12th where Elon was asked, will Pure Vision eliminate the phantom braking with bridges and overpasses? And Elon responded, yes. But I'm showing you this now because Tesla has seemingly removed any mention of radar on its website. And yes, this may vary region to region, but we know Tesla has been trending in that direction. And if you recall that 10,000 Tesla vehicle delivery delay, those vehicles that were sitting in the parking lot last week, that is most likely because of the transition, removing the radar, going to pure vision. 
If you wanna learn more about the peer vision situation, you can watch this video where I talk specifically about this move, one that is certainly controversial, but we will see how this peer vision strategy plays out over the next few months. And I found this picture on Reddit. I thought it was pretty cool. A Model S convertible that somebody saw in the French Quarter. And it's funny because all of the comments were talking not about the Model S that was converted to a convertible, but because of these suit shorts. So what do you guys think? I don't know, he's kind of pulling it off. Over the weekend, we also heard that Tesla's first known semi-chargers, which previously they have been referred to as mega chargers, are being installed at the Modesto facility for Frito-Lay. And this first iteration of the semi-chargers is being installed at their delivery center at 600 Garner Road in Modesto, California. The charging stations will service up to 100 Tesla semis, 15 of which are supposed to arrive later this year. This installation should also include a Megapack battery storage unit. Sadly, right now we don't yet know what these semi chargers or mega chargers will look like, but we do know that they could reach up to one megawatt in power per vehicle, by the way, one megawatt is a thousand kilowatts. And as we know, Tesla superchargers, the V3 version gets about 250 kilowatts. Basically these mega chargers or semi chargers are gonna be about four times more capable than a V3 supercharger. And it's currently not known whether or not Tesla vehicles can charge on these new stations. The charge port on the semi is different than other models. Speaking of that difference, here's a picture of the Tesla semi mega charger charging port. And these mega chargers are supposed to be capable capable of 400 miles of range in as little as 30 minutes of charging. And as you can see, the charging port reveals an eight pin configuration that's a lot larger actually than the supercharger port found on the S3, X, and Y. And if you recall on the Q3 2020 call, Jerome Guillen said in particular, these mega chargers, we realized that the 350 kilowatt or so that we might be looking for for cars is not going to be enough for the semi. And according to a press release from Pepsi, they are expecting to receive the 15 Tesla semis by the end of 2021. But just so you guys know, if we go to the actual press release, the only mention of Tesla comes at this place when it says, contributors to this project in Modesto include, and then a list of companies. So they didn't outright say that those 15 electric trucks were Teslas, it's just assumed and it's a fairly safe assumption. And back at the end of March, we learned that Tesla is building a new semi-production line at a new building near Giga, Nevada. It plans to produce five electric trucks per week at the outset. And this lines up because last year, Electric reported Tesla took over a large, more than 500,000 square feet large building in the industrial park where Giga Nevada is located. And yes, it has been confirmed that that building at 550 Milan Drive is next to another building used as a warehouse by Tesla. This one though is housing a new production line for the Tesla Semi. But yes, the plan is still for volume production to happen at Giga Austin once Tesla can ramp up the battery cell production line there, the 4680s. And let's remember that Elon did mention that Tesla could eventually produce 100,000 electric semis per year. Back in 2018, Elon said to analysts, so if you you take four years, I think 100,000 units a year is a reasonable expectation. Maybe more, but that's the right, roughly the right number, I think. 100,000 a year times about 150,000 ASP would be about $15 billion in extra annual revenue for Tesla sometime probably by 2023 through 2025. But Elon also mentioned at the end of March this year, demand is no problem for the semi, but near term cell supply makes it hard to scale. This limitation will be less onerous next year, so we can reasonably expect volume production of the semi to be definitely into 2022, but I do have some confidence we might see a few semis at the end of this year. And it's important to note the pilot plant, the Cato Road 4680 pilot plant, the primary mission this year is to support the production of the Model Y at Giga Berlin, which is expected to start in a few months. And remember, it's also supposed to supply Model Y at Giga Austin. And every Tesla Semi would require about six times as many battery cells as a Model Y. So for me, the timeline for Tesla's starting production of the Semi is going to be a great indicator in their confidence in the 4680 scaling process, which is arguably the most important thing that Tesla has going on. So I think this is a very important thread to follow. And yes, they'll figure it out and scale eventually, but of course, the sooner the better. And Jason Baptiste shared these pictures on Reddit of the original Tesla Roadsters being prepped for delivery back in 2008. 
So it's a great reminder of how far Tesla has come in 13 years. And if you extrapolate the next 13 years from where they are today, we're going to have so many more advancements and even things like picture quality with cell phones that has improved so dramatically over 10 years. It's going to be a very exciting decade. And we have a thread to watch here. Electric reported this morning, Tesla found guilty of throttling charging speeds and they were asked to pay $16,000 to thousands of owners. This was supposedly done through a software update, but only Model S and Model X vehicles with the 85 kilowatt hour battery packs, which were actually discontinued in 2016, seem to be affected so far. Tesla did tell Electric way back when that the goal of the update is to protect the battery and to improve battery longevity, and it resulted in a range loss for only a small percentage of owners. But there could be over 10,000 Tesla owners affected by this update in Norway alone, meaning it would be a roughly $150 million lawsuit or payout if this were to hold up. Now that's a big if and here is why. This was an insightful comment. This article shows an incredible lack of understanding of the Norwegian judicial system. This was arbitration court, the lowest level of civil courts in Norway. Tesla did not show, so the plaintiff was automatically awarded the max that the court can give. So that 16,000 US dollar figure would be the max payout. This decision will only stand if Tesla does not bring it to the next level where a proper trial would be held. They said bad PR move of Tesla to not show. But if any of you out there are Norwegians or anybody that's familiar with this court system, please feel free to comment below. But we'll see how Tesla handles this going forward. Thank you guys for watching. Please like this video if you did. A huge thank you to everybody on the next screen and I hope that you have a great day.